I love it when uh, the Lord, how He coordinates things, how He makes things happen. I don't know, but when, when He puts a message or something, a thought in your heart, I don't know if it happens to you, but you come to church and, oh, that song is about that, and that song is about that, and that prayer is about that. And then it's sort of like, you know, what sh- should I? It's like, well, <laughs> didn't you get it? And I don't know if you heard today, but you know, the songs that we sang was it said that he's king, that he is Lord. The last song was that he's ruler of all. The prayer was about being that humble and obedient to you. And that's sort of putting Christ where he belongs, if if that makes sense. I've had this message. Uh, it's not a message that I spoke to somebody. I think it was a message that I received from myself, but I've been just asked just to, to share it with you. So I don't know if it's so much a sermon as a, as a message, as questioning, that we should question ourselves some things in order to reveal for ourselves where we are and where we stand. And the thought that came to me was this. Do I know or do we know the real Jesus? And are you ready to meet the real Jesus. Now the straight answer would be, if I was to say, let's put your hands up, who's, really, who's ready to meet the real Jesus? Yeah, because we're in church, we're Christians, that's what we do, you know, that's why we're here. But if we just stop and we think about that question and we, we can try and analyze it, exactly in the same way that we would analyze this if we heard a sermon and we would think in our mind, this is so fantastic for that person. You know, I'm wondering if we can grab that analytical spirit, you know, the one, because we use it many times, and now analyze it for ourselves. So I wonder, this message would be fantastic for me. Do I know the real Jesus? And am I prepared to meet, am I ready to meet the real Jesus? Every one of us, when we hear the word Jesus, we get a certain image in our mind, certain thing that we've got in our mind of who Jesus is, what He looks like, what He's dressed like, what He would do in situations and circumstances. And if we were to just go a little bit in our minds and, and just ask ourselves, where did I get this image from? I was talk, talking the other night and, you know, the thought came up. Let me just ask you, what do you think when I say, what does Jesus look like? What comes to your mind straight away? Blue eyes, blonde hair, about that long. Isn't it? We got it from somewhere. Not quite sure where, but it's sort of in our minds. You don't think of him as a bit shorter, maybe bald, a bit stubby. Why? Where did we get that image from? Now, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but can you see that we've got a certain typical image of Christ? What about when it comes to the things that he is like or that he does what he's like as a person what is our expectations of him we all have a certain image but i believe god is is challenging this this image for me and i think if we come into god's word and we read it it's exactly like those of you that love reading a book and as you read a book the characters develop do they not and you find out what this person like and what that person is like, and you say, oh, this is the good character here. This is the hero. This is the nice person. Oh, and that's, that's the bad guy. That's the evil guy. And you get a knowledge by reading that book and being informed more of what's happening. You get to know the characters, yeah? The character of the characters in the book. That makes sense, yeah? So when we come to read the Word of God, how does the character of Christ develop to us in growing in us growing in the knowledge of him as we read and we grow in that knowledge what does that image of Christ develop in us is it something that we've heard somebody say is it something that we've picked up from our parents or a church or the preaching or the sermons Where did we get and where are we getting that image of Christ? And then how do we know that's the real Christ? 
I've done this exercise lately. Thank God for putting this on my heart. And as I'm reading the scripture, I'm intently looking, what is Christ doing? How is he? What does he say? And the things that he says and does, does it actually line up with my current thought of who Christ is and what he does and who he is? And I'm telling you, doing that, it's very challenging. I find that sort of my, my understanding and my interpretation can be challenged at many times when I look with the fresh eyes, not in saying, oh, yeah, well, this is interpretation, you know, historically looking back in those days and this and that. and You know, all the stuff that we put in our minds. And then if we stop and we search that thought and we say, but hold on a minute, Eli, where do you get that thought from? Is that thought how are we looking? The lenses that are we looking? Is it because it suits a certain mentality and a certain life that I've chosen or certain, what's the word these days? <coughs> Lifestyle. Am I being biased? Am I choosing a Jesus that suits me? Am I purposely being ignorant of the Word of God and interpreting it in such a way where it suits my current state? Why is it so important that we know the real Jesus? Why is it important that when we read it, we, 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 the only interpretation I believe now we should have is we've got the Scripture, which is the Word of God, right? The Word became flesh, so Jesus is this Word that we read. And we only need the interpretation of the Holy Spirit. God, I've just read this passage. I didn't understand the thing. Could you show me this for your Holy Spirit because I want to know the real Jesus? And as a good father that he is, he sees the heart of his children, desiring to know the truth, and he reveals to us his truth. Amen. Why is it so important to know the real Jesus? Because you and me, brothers and sisters, or whoever visiting us today, we will end up like the one that we follow, like the one that we believe in, like that image of Christ that we have, we will follow that and become like that. Wouldn't it be a shame after a life of following somebody or something, and then we heard the songs this morning, that every knee should bow, even the ones that have crucified Him, we know this from the Scriptures, even those that pierced Him will bow down and realize that He is Lord. Wouldn't it be a shame to turn up on that day and finally everybody bows down, including you and me, and we bow down before this Christ and we say, who's this guy? I didn't know you like this. I don't know who you are. And what do you think his response is? Go away from me. I don't know you either. Wouldn't it be a shame? Wouldn't it be a shame to, to read the scriptures, to come to church, to be very actively seeming Christians and to miss the mark? Why is it so important to know the real Jesus? Because we follow the Jesus that we make an image of. We become like Him because you like it or not. Those who have been married for a few years, you see, husbands become a bit more like the wives, wives a bit more like the husbands. You think, how did that happen? So let's be wise in these things. If we take Christ and He's in our lives, we are going to become like this Christ that we follow. Yeah? Let's not be stupid when it comes to these things. You know, the Scripture says that knowing this Christ, that we should be growing into the image of Christ. And we should be able to sort of analyze this and test this. What's the simplest test that we can have? Am I growing in obedience? This should be the most simplest test. It's not, is my hair growing long like Jesus? Are my eyes turning blue like Jesus? Am I growing in obedience that He was obedient unto death and death on a cross? Am I growing in obedience? See, it's something wonderful that we can measure this. We can test ourselves and say, am I growing in this? Am I growing like the real Jesus? Am I growing in obedience to His Word? The Word of God says that whoever believes in Him, in His Son, has eternal life. Yeah, but our belief and our growth in knowledge must be in who? In the Jesus that the book of John must be referring to. Not another one. 
there's another aspect to knowing Jesus. We have the Word, we have the Holy Spirit. But then there's a possibility to know Him. What does John says in Revelation? I mean, what, is, what does he say? He says that the one that, in, in, in 1 John, sorry, he says the one that we've known, the one that we've touched, the one that we've seen. In other words, the one that we know Him. He was with us. We were with Him. We saw what He was like. We know what He does and what He doesn't do. We saw how He acts and reacts in different situations and circumstances. So there's one way for all of us, and we can all be here, and I call it the shallow end of the swimming pool, and we know from what we hear and what we get informed and reading the Scriptures, and there's a, there's a knowledge that's there. And if we were to take a quiz of if we know Christ and how would He act and react in different circumstances, because of the knowledge that we have of the Word, we might be able to get a good score. But I want to ask you, are you willing to go towards the deeper end where your feet are no longer on the bottom of the pool? You know what I'm talking about. Where it's two meters, where it's over your head. Yeah? And now you got to start swimming. Do you know Christ there? Do you know Him? Do you live with a Christ that you can experience in your life on a daily basis? Is there a knowledge there in living life with Him? Is there a Christ in your life that you can experience on a daily basis? Or do you need to constantly run to the pastor and the elders? Can you not run to him yourself? Don't you know him like that? Don't you know him as the one that you can run to and ask and he will guide you? Do I need to ask, Pastor, what do you think? Is it good for me to steal that item or not to steal it? Have we not grown in the knowledge and experience with Him and His Spirit in us that He speaks to us and lives in us in that knowledge where now we're swimming that we know the Spirit of God speaks to me? Not because I read it and somebody might catch me. That He's in me, they shall not steal. There's a knowledge there of relationship, of, a, of something that nobody else can 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 come in between that. Do you know this real Jesus? Do you know a real Jesus that's with you on a daily basis? Or does it stop for you on a Sunday? Does it stop for you for reading that one chapter a day? Does it stop with you of just having a prayer on Tuesday? Do you know the real Jesus that's with you Wednesday and come Thursday and come Friday and come Saturday and the next day and the next day? Why settle for something less? I believe, and as I'm reading the Scripture, there is nothing more important than knowing Him. You see, the Scripture keeps on telling us in the New Testament, know Him, grow in the knowledge of Him, know Him, grow in the knowledge of Him. Why is it so important? Why are they telling us so many times? So we don't forget. So we don't lose the aim. So we don't lose the goal. Who here knows of a brand? I think it's called um, Coca-Cola. Who knows of that brand? Why do they still advertise it? Why are we encouraged to grow in the knowledge of Him? Because it means it's not enough how much we already know. Coca-Cola is probably one of the biggest brands around the world. Everybody knows them. Even in third world countries where they don't have anything, they know Coca-Cola. But still they find it necessary to remind people over and over and over again. And Scripture finds it necessary to remind us over and over again. Grow in the knowledge, grow in the knowledge, grow in the knowledge, grow in the knowledge. Why? Coca-Cola knows there's people that are born every day that I don't, they, don't know, they don't know about Coca-Cola yet and they want them to know. The Scripture knows there's more to know about Christ that we don't yet already know. Or maybe that we forgot. Who are you becoming more like? 
Which Jesus are you following? If we were to have a quiz, and just to challenge a bit our understanding and to see if we can mark ourselves on how much we know Christ. Out of the scripture, but also on an experience level, the one we experience it daily. I wonder if we were to ask ourselves, and probably the best way is we would know how would Jesus, how would God act or react in certain situations or circumstances? Test yourself. If Jesus was here, delivering a sermon, what do you think would happen? With the Jesus that you know right now, your image of Jesus, wherever you've got that from or you've built it from, or you think it's your own from the study of Scripture, you tell me, in your mind, if Jesus was here right now, having a sermon in our church, what do you expect that it would happen? The Jesus that you've got in your mind, what would He do? What would the atmosphere be like? No, none of you got the answer to say. <laughs> you know what my thought would be? And I've heard it before. That church is no good because the presence of God is not there. But if God is present, there'd be a powerful awakening, yeah? There'd be His presence overwhelming all of us. We would fall face down and worship Him and realize that He's Christ, He's Lord. It's true? Does it make sense? I tricked you a bit. Brothers and sisters, how many times has Christ not been present in our lives and in our church? And have we responded like that? We expect that for somebody else, not for ourselves, isn't it? We read the scriptures. Jesus was around for a few years and he spoke and he preached. Did everybody turn? Did everybody repent? Did everybody believe and followed Him? What does that mean? I should challenge myself, Lord, I can be in Your presence and I can still, there's a possibility that I might not believe, that I might not turn, that I might not repent, that I might not follow. Stop making excuses for yourself. Stop blaming it on others. Christ is real. And even if He doesn't speak for the person that's here, He should be speaking in your life. Am I, a you following the real Jesus? Are we responsive to His Word? What do you think if Jesus was here? Every sick person would be healed. Miracles. People that have demons will be freed. Then why are you and me in the state that we are? If the real Jesus is present in our lives. Do you remember the words of Jesus? He could do not many miracles because of their unbelief. Can you see through this what Christ is, 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 I believe, is telling us? Do you realize, man, woman, that you call yourself a child of God, that we ourselves can stop, can bring to a halt the mighty power of the living God? Do we know the real Jesus? Or do we expect another one? Do you find yourself a bit like John the Baptist? Can you guys go and ask him, is he the one or should we wait for another? Do we hesitate? Do we stop short? What do you think? How ready and how prepared is Jesus? Not to lose anybody, to keep everybody, you and me and others in the world. What is he prepared to do to keep us all close to him? Now, I know you're not going to answer anymore because you're 
you're thinking, what is he going to want in this? But Christ says that he doesn't look for the approval of man. And fortunately, praise God, that he does not base himself and the way that he conducts himself on the amount of approval that he receives on his Facebook page or the followers that he has. Listen to what I'm saying. When Jesus spoke some very harsh words, many of his followers stopped following him. And he turned to the handful that was left. And he said, what about you? Aren't you going? And Peter said, where are we going to go? Despite the fact that we, we realize that you are so strong in your word. And it's not easy to take what you've just said. And now, even us that are left, instead of saying, good on you guys, you're saying, what, aren't you going either? It's like your words are hurting us, Jesus. They're not comfortable to us. Peter still responds, where are we going to go? You've got the words of life. We know you're the Holy One of God. And even now, our understanding of the real Christ, we are challenged. The Christ that you've got in your mind and we've developed over the years from who knows where, what do you think his response would be? Peter, buddy, I knew I could rely on you. Good on you, mate. You're sticking by me in this hard time when everybody else left me. You know what the real Jesus said? I've chosen you. Everybody's gone. There's 12 left. I've chosen you. I just said, aren't you going either? They said, God, we're sticking with you because we know you're for real. And Jesus responded, I've chosen all of you. But one of you is a demon. I want to ask you, this Jesus, does it somehow not sit easy with you? Is this Jesus uncomfortable to you? What does his word say in the last days to Timothy chapter 4? You know what's going to happen? Many people won't be able to take the reality of Jesus and his gospel. And they're going to find and promote and encourage people and chase after people that will tell them things that they like to hear and they, they, that they desire. Why? Because the real Jesus was too much then. And it's too much now. So people are chasing a Jesus that fed them, multiplied the bread and the fish, and they had as, to eat as much as they, it, they, they could. And then when Jesus came to them and said, you know, you're not following me to obey me. You're following me because you had some uh, free food. And now you, you want to make me king so I can... Because they say, give us the do a miracle for us. Give us the manna like... You know, the people in the, uh, the Israelites in the desert had. Give us that free food daily. And Jesus has some strong words. If you want that food, I am the real bread that comes from heaven. You have to be partakers of me. And that's when the teacher says, this is too much. We want our type of Jesus. We want the type of Jesus that he's going to sit, we're going to sit we're going to listen to him. He's going to tell us wonderful things. He's going to tell us, keep away from the Pharisees because they're a bunch of hypocrites. Give us a free feed. But then when he comes and challenges us, hey, you've gone too far now. I don't like this sort of Jesus. So they go somewhere else. They stop following him. Are we for real? Are we following a real Jesus? In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, watch out that there is other Jesuses. 
there's different spirits and there's different gospels and in today's age this is God sent isn't it because everybody can find a Jesus and a gospel and a spirit that suits our lifestyle oh how wonderful really let me just think Lord you came to die for us to forgive my sin to wash me and it's like I'm a, I'm a vessel and now I'm clean so I can fill it again with gunk and rubbish and then search and find the Jesus that's going to be happy and approval of what I do and how I am when you put it like that does it actually make sense to any of us Whose kingdom are we building up? Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this earth. What are we searching for? Things to be nice and leisurely and pleasant. And I'm going to be happy. And be okay in retirement and have friends and people around me that encourage me and appreciate me. And you know the stuff that we seek. I don't need to tell you. You know what it is. You've got the same. Or are we part of a kingdom that's not of this earth? That is not searching the things that everybody else searches and seeks. In Job chapter 5, you know we are told, listen, you can study the scriptures. And in them you might think, I might be able to find the Jesus that suits me. Are you looking and searching for a Jesus that lets you have boyfriend, girlfriends? Are you looking and searching for a Jesus that lets you slip around? Are you looking for a Jesus that lets you not pay your taxes? Are you looking for a Jesus that lets you do your own thing? Is that what you're searching the Scriptures for? Jesus says, hey, can't you see exactly the Scriptures that you're searching it for what you want to get? They're actually talking about me, the real Jesus. Are you so blinded that you cannot see? Jesus tells him these Scriptures that you are searching for your own ways it's actually talking about me the real jesus are you ready to receive are you ready to accept look at the pharisees brothers and sisters this this worries me it scares me people highly knowledgeable in the word of god and they didn't have to study hebrew to find out the root word of the word you thought about that they knew exactly what it meant it was their language and this is all they did. As far as I can see, they didn't have any day jobs. This is all they did. They dedicated themselves to the scriptures and knowing them and knowing them and, and being obedient to giving a tenth of the, the herbs in the garden. And working out on a Sabbath, you are not allowed to work, defying the word work. Even defying the word work is not to walk more than a certain amount of of distance this is all they did they gave themselves to it for me this is an alarm bell these people that were most in the knowledge and most prepared to search in the scripture and finding out Jesus says they're talking about me and then the real Jesus comes and what do they do in them Can you see them picking up the stones? Can you see the irritation? Can you see the anger? Because this Jesus that he calls himself now the Son of God, Christ, the one that was meant to come, this is not the Jesus that we wanted. This is not the Jesus, the image that we have made for ourselves. This Jesus that has now come irritates us, upsets us, makes us mad. He's not the one that we expect. We expect another For me, for you, there should be a big question mark here. What is the Jesus that we are looking for and we are searching for? Are we prepared to meet and be confronted with the real Jesus? In Ephesians in chapter 4, it says, you know, listen, you can be darkened in your understanding and separated from the life of God. Yes, yes. Me, you can be right here sitting in church, hearing a sermon from whoever comes and whoever we invite. Godly sermons. 
Even if that person says, oh, he's not of good character, I know him, he's not... It, forget it, he's a donkey, right? But the word of God can still be transmitted through that person. Am I and you willing to walk in obedience? Or can we be sitting here and be darkened in our minds, in the understanding and separated from the life of God? As a result of what? Due to the hardening of our hearts. You know what that is? When we are confronted with the real Jesus, and in our minds and in our hearts, we don't have to show it on our faces that we don't like this, but in our hearts there's a little bit of, nah, it doesn't really suit me. That's not, that's not what I expected of Jesus. The Word of God is very clear. Those who love me, obey me. And those who do not love me, do not obey me. Another exam we can test ourselves in. Not me test you, you test me. You test yourself. Obedience. Did you see in the Word of God, in Acts when the disciples, they're, they're being punished for preaching the Word of God, and then they are beaten, and then there's a statement there that has just struck me the last few days. That Peter says something. He says, we must obey God. In that word, I do not find any movement to the left or the right. In the word must, is very tight parameters yeah and it's only here that's what must we must obey God brothers sisters fellow Christians that we call ourselves it is time for us that we ourselves will repent and come before the real Christ because we are going to meet him one day Do we only want to find out who He is on that day? I want us to test ourselves a little bit more deeper. Children, we must obey God. Yes? Those who obey love Him and belong to Him and those that do not obey do not love Him and do not belong to Him. Clear. Black and white. Let's go a bit further. Children, obey your parents in everything. For this is the will of God. Not just when you like it, not just when you want to, not just when you feel like it. Does that stir a bit of uncomfortableness? The Word of God is made to confront us not to be leisurely and easy and relaxed. Let's go a bit deeper to the next step. Wives, submit yourselves to your husband in everything as you submit to Christ. Well, if this is how you submit yourself to Christ, that's how you submit yourself to your husband. Do these words bring a bit of uneasiness? Maybe an irritation? Husbands, love your wives and wash them in the word. Be the priest of your household. And serve the Lord your God with everything that you are. Bringing up your children and your family and your household, managing it wisely and bringing them Nurturing them and growing them in the knowledge of Christ. Does this upset you and irritate you? You know when it does? When we are guilty of it. Of being disobedient. We like to be masters and boss. Not even Christ can tell us what to do. Slaves. Be submitted to your 
masters, workers, be submitted to your, to your bosses, not only when they are there to see. Look what I've done. Look who I am. Look how worthy I am. Is there an irritation when we hear these words? Is there an uncomfortableness? That's a good thing. It means that the Holy Spirit has not given up on us. It is making us feel uncomfortable. That there's something there that God needs to do a work in us. Do we know the real Jesus? Masters, careful how you treat your slaves. For you have a master over you. Be fair. Don't build up your own kingdom. Build up the kingdom of Christ. Don't use and abuse others to build up your kingdom. Don't store treasures for you in these last days. But know that you have a master. Those who have a ministry, do you like to be commended and to commend yourself? Look who we are. Look who we've done. Oh, the brother's so great. The brother's so great. Such great, such... Does it irritate me? Does it upset me when I hear this? Does it make me feel uncomfortable? It's because there's something wrong there. Do you know the real Jesus? Do you know the real Jesus who is involved in your life? Is He a father to you? Is He one that's involved in your life like a father? Does He tell you what to do and what not to do? Does He restrict you and stop you from doing things that are not good for you, even though you disagree? Does He expect you to do His will and not yours? Does He expect you to submit to Him and to be fully obedient? Does He come and discipline you? Does He come and point out things in your life that are not according to His ways? Not to your imagination or imaginary Jesus that we've built in our minds over the years, but in the reality of His Word when we read it and we don't make excuses. And it cuts to the heart of when somebody speaks or preaches and it's uncomfortable. Does He come and discipline us there? Does He come and show us? Does He do a cutting and operation? Are you right now irritated by these words? Upset? Uncomfortable? Enough to walk away? Enough to walk out? Enough for you to clench your teeth, to pick up a stone and be ready to throw it at whoever speaks like this or if Christ is really like this, I don't want to have anything to do with Him? Are these words irritating you enough to be ready to crucify Him? Who crucified Jesus? Don't you think He was the ones that ate the bread that He multiplied? Don't you think He was the ones that when He entered Jerusalem, they took the palm tree leaves and they put them down? And hallelujah, glory be to the one that comes in the name of the Lord. And when Jesus didn't live according to their expectation to become king, to become Messiah, to bring in the rule of David, to get rid of the Roman, we don't like this Jesus. And then we follow him and we eat his bread and, and we are here with him. And then he says to us, you're not the, the sons of Abraham. You are the sons of the devil because you are disobedient and you don't know me. And instead of receiving that and saying, Lord, we are. We repent. They were ready to pick up stones and throw it at him. Who crucified Jesus? Did Jesus make everybody happy? 
Was everybody comfortable in his presence? Jesus stirred people up. Jesus made people feel uncomfortable with their, with their lives. Even the Pharisees that were righteous according to the law. Paul calls himself, as far as it comes to the law, I am righteous without fault. And oh, did Jesus challenge him. Paul, Paul. Saul, Saul. On the road to Emmaus, what are you doing? You think you're righteous according to the law. What are you doing? I will show him how much he must suffer for me. Can I call you brothers and sisters? Can I still call you brothers and sisters? Do you know the real Jesus? You know, it's not a problem to say, no, I don't. But there's something else. You can know the real Jesus. He's not too far from us. Do we want to wait until that day when we will finally know Him? Like we've heard here before, we had the brother here. And he said, my opinion about myself and my church is pretty good. And I think that Jesus would agree with me. But just in case, I'll ask him. Is your Jesus real enough to hear that question and to respond to it? Your Jesus, the one that you've imagined it, probably isn't. Maybe he doesn't even get involved in your life and doesn't press the buttons. But the real Jesus, he's got an opinion right now about you and me and our lives and our lifestyle and our choices and everything that we do and we make and we prioritize in who we are. He's got an opinion. Don't you want to know what that is? Do you and me, do we really want to leave it and be surprised on that last day? And somehow be shocked? Go away from me, you who have worked. I don't know you. But Jesus, these people knew him by name, but Jesus, didn't we do that and that and that and that in your name? Of course we know you. We just, can you see this attitude here? Lord Jesus, of course we know you. Are you forgetting? Are you so old now that you forget who we are? Go away from me. I don't know you. Do we want to leave such a shocking possible truth for that last day? Today is the day of grace. What does that mean? It means that the uncomfortableness that is in our hearts right now, and that may be irritation and even anger, is that it should tell us plainly and clearly, Lord, I'm wrong. I've been wrong and I've accepted and I thought that you accepted as well. Can you show me? Can you show me who I am? Can you open my eyes and remove the blinds from my eyes that I may see who I am? I want to know your opinion of me. I want to be truthful and I want to be real. I want to be transparent. Lay it down how it is. Don't soften it for me. I don't want to be, oh, you look fantastic. You're great. You're... The Word of God says that these sort of friends we do not need who butter you up but a true friend is known by the scars he makes, by the scars he creates. You know what that means? Hey, it's not good. That's not right. That's a true friend, somebody who cares how much more the Lord your God that has given his life for you. But he doesn't butt in. He's waiting for that question 
for that sincerity, for that desire from you and me and say, Lord, please, I want to know how you see the things in my life. I want to know the real you. I don't want to be surprised on the day. I don't want to think that I am doing well, that I am rich, that I need nothing, and that I am so blessed abundantly, but not seeing the reality that I am naked, that I am poor, that I am sick, that I am blind, thinking that I've got this Jesus, and being shocked on the, on the day of revelation that He doesn't know me and I don't really know Him. Right now you're probably thinking there are people that need to hear this message. Wrong. Me, you, we need to hear this. This word that is spoken, it wasn't for people who were outside in the world. They knew Jesus and they did miracle in His names. The Pharisees were people that in the temple day and night and were studying His word. These are people and this is for people that we have a knowledge, some kind of knowledge of Jesus and we can be deceived with that. I think the word from long ago it's relevant to us again. Christians, it is time to repent and turn to the real Jesus. I see that the time is short. The scripture says time is short and evil. Let's search our lives. How are we living? What are we doing? Where is our heart? What is our attitude? And you know what? We don't have to, again, go home and find some kind of peace, somebody or a word in the scripture or on YouTube, somebody who just put us at peace and to tell us that we are okay the way that we are. We've heard this morning that we have been set free and free indeed from what? From deception and thinking that we are okay. And now we are free to see him clearly for who he is and how he is. This is the freedom that we've received. That we are no longer blinded by the sinfulness of the world and our own attitude and behaviors. That we can see Him freely. That we can be cleansed of that and say, Lord, I want the real Jesus to take His shape and His image in me. I want the reality of Christ. The real Jesus. How much, how much I wish that we can quiz ourselves and question ourselves and have this frank prayer before God and say, can the real Jesus stand up? The real Jesus that's at the right hand of the Father. And I want to see you and you alone. Like Paul said, I don't want to know anything else but Christ. And Him lifted up, crucified among you. Our real Jesus is not maybe in your imagination just that little Jesus in the manger. Was not only the miracle worker. Was not only the sacrifice on the cross. Was not only in the day of resurrection. Is not only the one at the right hand of the Father. But he's also coming back and he's coming back as a judge and will repay back. Are you ready for this word? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 6 to 9. God is just. He will pay back. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. The real Jesus is all these things. Are you prepared? Am I prepared? Am I ready to meet the real Jesus? Brothers and sisters, it's not comfortable. It is not comfortable in the presence of Jesus. 
please have a new fresh start. Start reading the scriptures. And ask yourself, Lord, I hear these things. Am I one of the ones that walks away? Or can I say like Peter, where are we going to go? We're sticking around because you are the one that has the words of life. You know what that means? You don't suit us, but we depend on you. Listen, Jesus might not suit us how we want him to be right now in our current state. But do you realize like Peter that you and me, we depend on him. And if we realize we depend on him, then it's a different life. It's a different life. It's a life where it's one of relationship and it's not bothersome to fulfill and obey His commandments. At the moment, if they are bothersome and they are too heavy and we can't be bothered, that's not the real Jesus. But the real Jesus comes and works in us just like a father and son. Don't always see eye to eye. There's discipline there. There's friction. There's... But as the son grows in the knowledge of the father, there's a desire for the son to be fulfilling of God's word and walk in obedience for the simple thought. I want to bring pleasure and joy to my father. Even if in our minds he's old and in a nursing home and can't remember everything, and I'm so much smarter than him. And I've got fresh, fresh interpretation of his word. And the things have moved along and we have modernized now. Let not God be in your mind an old person in a nursing home that you go and visit on birthday and Christmas and Easter. Can you see him today? The reality of a father who's involved in your life. And wants to be involved in your life. And speaks to you and speaks to me and calls us near to him. Why? I have gone to prepare a place. Now God doesn't want to be alone there. That all those who are mine will be with me for eternity. Can you see even this morning through this uncomfortableness state. That God is reaching out in his love towards us. And calling us near to Him. Can you see that love? Can you see the outstretched arm to you? And can you see the pierced hands? Can you see that He's done something about it? To delete that gap between man and God. Can you see it? Remain in me. And I will remain in you. But in this, there's got to be a total surrender from our part. A total picking up of the cross. A total of dying to ourselves. A total submission and obedience to Him. Whatever that might be. Even death and death on a cross. Are you prepared? Are you ready to know this Jesus and to follow this Jesus? Or are you searching and seeking for a befriended Jesus? People of God, He is so near. If you listen carefully, you can hear His footsteps. The time is near. The time of feeling good about ourselves has come to an end. The time of knowing Christ is here. Let us not be foolish and sell our birthright for a bowl of warm soup that satisfies temporarily. And I believe by that the Holy Spirit can tell you what that means right now.
Let's not be foolish. One more thing. Can we have a time of prayer? Can we stand or kneel? Or... We have a couple of ways of responding right now. We can be part of the mob who picks up the hammer and the nails and calls out, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! Crucify Him! We can come before Him and say, Lord, have mercy on me and remember me. Even for the first ones, God says, Lord, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. See the hope. Can you see the gate of grace open before you? Even if we don't know what we're doing, Christ on the cross is still calling out, Father, forgive them. They want me crucified. They, they, there's hatred here. But forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But he turns to the thief next to him and he says, because of what you said, you realized who you are and your need of me. And Jesus, God himself, makes a promise. Today, you will be with me in paradise. That promise is for me and you right now. Amen. Today. Today we can be with Him. Today we can be with Him in paradise. Today we can experience the real Jesus. Today. Don't be fooled. There's no tomorrow. We have today. And if we hear His word today, do not let your heart be stubborn and hardened. Do not let your ears be blocked. Today, Christians, it is time to repent and to turn to the real Jesus. And ask Him what He would have us do. And seek His face and His will. Not that we do our own thing and then we pray, Lord, help me in what I'm doing. The real Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. But mark the words of the Scripture. He is close. He is near. He is coming back. Grace will be taken and judgment will come. Where will you and me find ourselves? Already in Him? Or only then discovering that we've made a different Jesus in our minds and we've followed something that is not? Today is the day of repentance. Let's come before God with our hearts. Lord, you know. You know man and what he is. You know me and who I am and what I am. Lord, please, I read, I need, I need, I need grace. And open my eyes to see the real you. And not only to hear this and to go back being me, but Lord, to allow you to come and change me and transform me for your power to make me like the real Jesus. And you know you are made like the real Jesus because the world hated him, even the Pharisees. And you too will be hated. Why? Because in you the Spirit of God will show and make known to others that they are living in ways that are not pleasing to Him. Coming to Christ, you will not be liked. But can you see that He is more worthy than that? Let's pray.